Mrs. Rumtefusel's Fur Coat, P. L. McMillan. I watched Susan stomp down the sidewalk past West Salem Junior High School on 8th Street, her patent black shoes crushing the calico carpet of dried leaves as she went. Hurry up, Michael, she called over one shoulder. I shook my head, bouncing my car keys in my hand. What is this place supposed to be called again? I asked. Molly said it was off 8th, between the junior high school and the soda bar. You're such a ditz, Susan. You don't even know where it is? We're wasting time. Let's just go. You can throw together a witch costume or something, I groaned. My girl spun around on one heel, planted her hands on her hips, and glared at me. Michael Ritchie Reed, she said, stomping one heel against the pavement. I couldn't help but grin. She was all of five feet three inches and didn't make a very intimidating threat. You know as well as I do that Caroline is going as the same character as me, even though I told her I was going to the Salem Halloween Street Fair as at first. I won't go there as a witch. There'll be a thousand girls dressed as witches. No, I am going to be the best dog napper there is, and we'll see the look on Caroline's face when she sees I got a real fur coat to go with my costume. I threw my hands up to signal my surrender. Satisfied, she grabbed my hand and pulled me after her as she continued down the sidewalk. Just a couple of stones from the soda bar, she yanked me into an alleyway. You've got to be kidding me. You think the store's down this way? I asked. Susan ignored me and concentrated on dodging the many swamps of rotting leaves. Susan, come on, there's nothing here, I said. Here we are. She dropped my hand and pointed up to a weathered sign that looked like it had been painted a hundred years ago. It read, Mrs. Rumtefusel's Museum of Oddities. This is a museum, I said. Yeah, so? So they don't sell things in a museum, they display things. Chill out. I'll convince whoever is working that it's an absolute necessity that they let me have what I want. If that doesn't work, there will always be the five-finger discount. She dashed inside without waiting for me. I was left wondering what I saw in her. She was the typical daddy's little girl, used to getting everything and anything she wanted. Some days, I was convinced she was only dating me because I was the quarterback at school and she was the head cheerleader. So, it was expected. I followed her inside. The place was weird. Right off the bat, there was this musty smell like wet clothes had been left to dry in a heap on the floor. There were no overhead lights, just small bulbs clipped to the edges of wooden display tables. Susan had rushed past the small, unmanned reception desk, shrouded in shadow. The wooden desk was bare besides an antique concierge bell and a wooden box. The box had a large slit in the lid, and carved into the side were the words, Donations graciously accepted in wild curly cues. I dug my wallet out. All I had were two faded dollar bills, the last of my bi weekly allowance. I wouldn't get another fiver till Monday. Sucking my teeth, I pushed one of my dollar bills through the slot. Turning, I took in the small museum. The silence inside was oppressive. There were thirteen display tables. On each table was a single item with a yellowed informational card placed by it illuminated by those harsh clip-on lights. Susan was bent over, reading the card next to a strange-looking china doll, five tables in. I went to the first table on the left, where the single pearl lay on a dusty red cushion. The card on the table read, The Widow's Pearl, purchased from the Indich Estate, circa 1902, known to have claimed as many as 23 victims, all male. Cause of death usually choking though at least two victims are known to have slipped on the widow's pearl and died by broken neck. The pearl itself was large, with a brilliant pink iridescence. I reached out with my left index finger, wondering if it felt as warm as it looked. Don't touch. I about near jumped out of my skin. I jerked up and turned to a woman who stood half in the shadows by the reception desk. From what I could see, she was an Amazon, taller than me, broad, and all muscle. Her pale blonde hair was tied up in a tight bun behind her head. Her eyebrows were an even lighter color, almost invisible against her pale skin. She wore a black pinstripe suit, cut in severe lines. Sorry, uh, ma'am. I said, do not touch, she said, not moving any closer. Michael, oh, oh come here, this is just perfect. I wanted to turn and go to her, but I felt caught in the woman's icy stare. I, I won't touch. 
I'm sorry. I just, I'm, I wasn't thinking. All the victims of the widow's pearl have been men. Think on that, she said. Susan was at my elbow, tugging at my hand. She only then noticed the woman standing by the desk. There was a moment of quiet, so quiet that I could hear Susan's breathing. That bright, bubbly girlfriend of mine stepped forward. Hello! I just love your museum. Are you the owner? The woman stared at me a moment longer. Susan looked at me and back at the Amazon. You'd be Miss Rumtefusel? Susan tried again. She finally had the strange woman's attention, and I felt released from the pressure of her stare as the tall woman turned to Susan. In my hand, I felt Susan's begin to sweat. Mrs. Rumtefusel was my great-great-grandmother. I am Mrs. Cutler. Welcome to the Museum of Oddities. It is the prized possession of my family, of which I am the last. Each item displayed was carefully vetted and purchased by the Rumtefusel family. You have already met the widow's pearl, slayer of husbands and fathers alike. Among the other treasures are the fang of the splinter cat, the infamous hangman's hand, and one of the stones used to crush Giles Corey. That's great, but what about the coat? The one at the very back? Susan tripped over her words. Grandma Rumtefusel's fur coat, Mrs. Cutler stated. Yes, that's the one. It's just perfect. Susan pulled me towards the back of the museum. On the thirteenth table was a wooden bust of a woman over which a thick fur coat was draped. The bust itself was creepy, the face devoid of features. But the coat was beautiful. It was full length and it was the color of pristine snow, as luxurious as a lynx. What struck me most, after the sheer beauty of it, was its stench. Though I stood a couple feet away, I could smell its thick, animalistic scent. Though the sight of the coat attracted me, the smell repulsed me more, and I moved farther away from it. Susan didn't seem bothered by the smell. Or maybe she didn't notice it. She made to reach for it before she managed to restrain herself. She turned to face Mrs. Cutler. How much? Susan asked, her voice as husky as it was when we were messing around in my car. Excuse me? Mrs. Cutler said. How much for the fur coat? The items in the museum are not for sale. Price isn't an issue, Susan said. Susan, she said it wasn't for sale, I said. I just need it for today. I need it for a costume for the Halloween festival, Susan said. I'll pay just to rent it. It's not safe to remove from the museum, Mrs. Cutler said. The woman showed no anger, no annoyance, no emotion whatsoever. And that actually scared me more than if she'd started yelling at Susan. Let's just go, I said. Shut up, Michael. Now, I said price isn't an issue, Mrs. Cutler, so how much? Mrs. Cutler stared at Susan and then smiled for the very first time. You must have it back before sundown. It must be back in this museum by then, do you understand? Mrs. Cutler said. Oh, yes. Oh, this is just perfect, Susan squealed. Then, for the afternoon, it will be $75. Susan dug into her purse, pulling out a wallet. It was fat with bills her daddy had given her, and she yanked out four twenties, thrusting them at Mrs. Cutler. Keep the change, please, for doing me this huge favor, Susan said. Mrs. Cutler slipped the bills in the left pocket of her pants. I have a box large enough in the back. Let me go retrieve it. Michael, can you believe it? This is so swell. Don't you think you were a little spoiled just then? I couldn't contain my anger. It was something about this museum, the reek of the coat and the owner's unnerving smile. Lighten up, Michael. You're such a square sometimes. A rustle behind us alerted us to Mrs. Cutler's return with the box. She slipped past us with the grace of a cat. I shot a look at Susan, but she ignored me. Mrs. Cutler placed the large cardboard box on the floor and lifted the coat from its stand. Folding it into the box at her feet, Mrs. Cutler put the lid on, picked up the box, and returned to us. Remember, back before nightfall, don't forget, the woman said, handing the box over to Susan. Of course. Come on, Michael, let's go. I have to get dressed for the festival. Susan whirled around and pranced toward the front door. I followed her, turning back at the door to look at Mrs. Cutler as she stood in her shadowy museum. She raised one long hand in farewell, her face as blank as it had been when we first met. Susan was halfway down the alley when I stepped out. The cloudy day was outright blinding compared to the dim lighting within the museum. 
Squinting, I jogged after her, catching up as she reached the sidewalk. I am so, so excited. I can't believe my luck. I really owe Molly a Coke for telling me about that place. Though that woman was rather rude, don't you think? About as rude as you, I said. Don't be fuzzy, baby. Let's go to my house and get ready. I bet my dad has some beer in the fridge we could grab, too. He won't even notice. I sighed. It was pointless. She wouldn't listen. She'd gotten her way, and now she was the happiest woman in the world. Instead, I opened the car door for her and helped her in. During the whole drive to her house, her right hand rested on top of the box while the other roamed restlessly in my lap. I forgot all about Mrs. Cutler and her museum of morbidity. All I could think about was whether Susan had mentioned if her parents were out today at the country club. Susan sat at her vanity, applying thick green eyeshadow, dressed only in sheer white panties. She glanced at me in the mirror, over her pale shoulder. You need to get ready. Your costume's on the chair. I groaned and sat up, swinging my legs over the edge of the bed and making sure she got the full show before pulling on my underwear. I dodged the dirty clothes, textbooks, and pens on the white carpet and made my way down to the white wooden chair in the corner of the room. Laid out for me was a Dalmatian costume. You gotta be kidding me, I muttered. Susan stood, slipping on a sexy black evening dress I would bet anything she borrowed from her stepmother's closet. It hugged her curves, fluttering to her feet. Never in my life had I seen anything as beautiful as her in that moment, with her blonde hair cascading in a waterfall down her back and her eyes lit up with glee at her own magnificence. She began knotting her hair behind her head in preparation for the ratty wig she'd bought and dyed to match the cartoon characters. I pulled on the polka-dotted white shirt and cotton pants, soon as it had made it out of some of her dad's old pajamas and black felt. This is going to be huge on me, I complained. Well, if you'd bothered to go out and buy a costume, I wouldn't have had to waste time making you one. There was no arguing that, so I got dressed. Susan pulled on a pair of sexy black heels and then opened up the cardboard box on her floor. Right away, even on the opposite side of the room, I could smell the coat. The thick musk reminded me of how the bedroom smelled after sex with Susan. Moist, hot, and musty. She pulled the coat on, turning around to admire herself in the full-length mirror. She ran her hands down the fur slowly, seeming to relish in the feel of it. It was beyond creepy. Ready? I asked to interrupt the moment. This coat feels amazing. You should touch it, Susan said, not taking her eyes off of herself in the mirror. Come on, Susan, I said, desperate to get out of the room and into some fresh air. All right, already. Hold your horses. I'm coming. She followed me down the stairs, out the front door, into my car, all the while stroking that creepy fur coat. The whole way to the Halloween festival, she babbled about how her costume was going to blow Caroline's out of the water. I pulled into a parking spot in a nearly full lot a few blocks from Commercial Street and helped Susan out of the car. She squealed with glee upon seeing the festival. The whole of Commercial Street had been decorated for the holiday. Black and orange bunting decorated the street lamps and tables of food and drink. Bunches of balloons bobbed about in the faint wind, pulling against their sandbag anchors. At the far end of the street, a band played on a raised stage while couples danced. The stage was framed by a huge white banner stating, Salem's Annual Halloween Bash, 1961. The rest of the street was lined with tables boasting caramel corn, candied apples, and sugar cookies decorated to look like black cats and ghosts. Interspersed between those vendors were game tents with apple bobbing, darts, whack-a-mole, and ring toss. The air was alive with the laughter and screams of children of Salem, chasing each other dressed in a rainbow of costumes. There were dozens of witches, a bunch of mummies, a handful of ghosts, some clowns, and a few goblins. Parents stood among the edges of the street with cups of cider in hand, watching their little ones and enjoying the mild evening temperatures. Oh, look, Michael, Susan cried, pointing at one of the brightly colored game stalls. Win me that Dalmatian toy. It would fit perfectly with my costume. I thought of the single dollar I had left and tried to think of an excuse, but it didn't matter. She was already distracted. She'd caught sight of our friends, which included her rival of the day, Caroline. Susan grabbed my hand and began to pull me towards them. I was surprised at how cold and clammy her hand was, despite how warm the evening was. The edge of the fur coat sleeve brushed against the back of my hand, and I couldn't help but jerk away, pulling out of Susan's grasp. She didn't notice, just pushed on through the crowd. I saw Caroline give Susan the head-to-toe and scowl. 
I joined everyone in time to hear Caroline say, Gorgeous coat, Susan. Must have cost a fortune. Susan laughed and winked at Molly. My pal, Noah, pulled a flask from his leather jacket and offered it. I took a swig. Susan snatched it from me and drank it long and deep. She could drink most of the group under the table. For her size, it ought to be recorded in the Guinness Book of World Records. Even out in the open air, I could smell the coat and I made every effort to avoid touching it. All the chicks were impressed with it, stroking the luxurious white fur. The guys stood farther away, passing around a cigarette. The seven of us made our way down to the bandstand. Isn't this amazing? Susan asked, joining me at the back of the pack. She'd commandeered a different flask from somewhere. She was sashaying on her heels, and every time she swung my way, it was all I could do not to jump out of the way to avoid the coat. I checked my watch as we reached the edge of the crowd of dancers. I didn't need to know the time to know that it was almost night. The setting sun was proof enough. Hey, Susan, don't you think it's time we took the coat back? Mrs. Cutler said you had to have it back before night fell, I said, eager to be rid of the reeking thing. Don't be that way, Michael. I can't leave now. The party's only getting started. You made an agreement with her. Shush, Michael. You're making a scene. I have $40 more in my purse. I'll give that to her as a late fee. Susan took another swig from the flask. The sky had become that washed-out gray-blue, typical for a cool autumn evening. Looking at the first faint stars, I shivered. It had gotten dark so quickly. Susan had gone on ahead of me. The orange paper lantern strung between the street lamps cast an amber hue over her hair and an alluring glow to her face. The rest of the gang had been filtered out by the crowds, and the air was heavy with music, raucous laughter, and cheerful screams. She looked so fragile, surrounded by the bustling throngs, so small and undersized in that ugly fur coat. She stumbled and had to catch on the coat sleeve of some man beside her. I hurried to catch up and found it was the reverend who had caught her. The small, bald man was holding her hands and steadying her. His brows were beetled up with disgust. As she swayed toward him, he jerked away, completely avoiding the hem of the coat as it swung towards his thigh. Sorry, reverend, she's not used to wearing heels, you see, I lied lamely. The man cleared his throat three times in quick succession, a habit I'd grown to loathe every Sunday. Is she unwell? I'm fine, Reverend. I'm having a swell time. Guess, guess my costume. Go on, guess. Susan giggled, taking her hands out from his to give him a little whirl. I cringed. If he figured out she was drunk, it would be both our asses in the frying pan. She's so pale, Michael. I think she might be coming down with something, dressing in such... The Reverend's mouth puckered as though the words he was trying to spit out were sour. Such scanty clothing will give her the death of a cold. Yes, sir. Of course, sir. I began pulling Susan away, allowing her to lean against my side despite having to allow the coat to press against me, too. It felt hot against my skin, almost moist despite how dry the air was. Take her home, Michael. You don't want her getting sick. The reverend's voice chased me. We were barely enveloped by the crowds when Susan was pulling that damn flask out of wherever she was hiding it. I reached out to snatch it away, but she dodged my attempt and gulped down whatever was left in it. Looking at her, I saw the Reverend was right. She was very pale. Her eyes were glassy and unfocused. She was breathing in quick, shallow gasps. Come on, Susan, let's go. This party's getting lame anyway, I said. Michael, you have to win me a Dalmatian toy first. You promised. And afterward, can we go... Fine. God, Michael, you're such a dweeb. Susan weaved through the people that filled the street. She was hunched forward, her face nearly parallel to the ground. She held her arms out at her sides and looked, comically, like she was trying to cross an invisible tightrope. People were turning to stare. The children laughed and pointed. The adults screwed up their faces in disapproval. The coat was a massive hulk on her back, weighing her down. She was an embarrassment. In that moment... Her looks and charm were outshadowed by her obnoxious behavior. After this, maybe it was time to break up with her. Why should it matter if she was the prettiest girl in school? All she cared about was herself. I felt guilty knowing that Mrs. Cutler was waiting for us to bring her coat back to her. It was a family heirloom. She was probably worried sick that Susan was spilling something on it or damaging it somehow. She'd trusted us, two kids, and we'd let her down. Worst of all, Susan would try to make everything better with her daddy's money, just like she always did. She was waiting on me by the ring-toss stall. 
She was partly collapsed against a lamppost, clinging to it. Her face and skin were sickly in the sodium light. She looked miserable. She lifted her face up to me as I approached her. Her eyes were huge and dark. Her lips were pulled down in one of her pouts. I felt my heart melt. I don't feel so good, Michael. I hesitated before overcoming my distaste for touching the fur coat, then wrapped both my arms around her. She fell against my chest, her forehead cracking against my sternum. Let's go get rid of that coat and I'll take you home, okay? I felt her nod against my chest. It was slow going. Despite the later hour, the street was thick with children, high on sugar. I led Susan behind the festival stalls. Enclosed in the shadows of shop doors, mouths of alleys, and behind game stalls were teenagers and young adults, pressed close to each other and occasionally illuminated by the ember of a cigarette. As we progressed down the street, towards the parking lot where my car waited, Susan grew limper and limper. I expected it to become more difficult to carry her, but in fact she was growing lighter, more intangible. Her feet dragged on the asphalt. Looking down, I noticed she'd lost one of her heels. I paused, letting her hang off of me, and looked over my shoulder. I couldn't see it from where I was, and I decided to consider it lost. Let Susan deal with it in the morning, after she'd recovered from her hangover. The noise level dropped to a dull echo as we turned off Commercial Street. Susan moaned a bit. She was slipping from my grasp, so I stopped, readjusting my grip, pulling her closer. The fur coat tickled my nose and neck. Its muskiness made me gag. The material felt hot, soft, almost fleshy in my arms. I want to go home, Susan slurred. We're almost there, just a bit more. But we still had two blocks to go, and it was becoming impossible to drag Susan along the way I was. She'd given up entirely on supporting herself. I stumbled over to the pharmacy to my left. I propped her up against the brick wall. Her knees immediately gave way, and she slipped down. Her head slumped into her right shoulder, and she began to slide that way to the ground. She looked horrible. Her skin clung to her bones, pulling her lips back against her teeth in a corpse's smile. Her ribs were highlighted in the sharp shadows on her chest, and her breasts drooped down in her knees. Gone were the smooth muscles of her arms and legs that helped make her so attractive. She was made out of sticks now. The stinking coat, on the other hand, was huge. Susan's chest was throbbing with her panicked breaths and her eyes fluttered against her cheeks. I knelt before her and pressed my hand against her forehead. She was cold and clammy. Susan? Susan, can you hear me? So hot. One of her hands rose, violently shaking in the air as she tried to find me. I grasped her fingers and kissed them. It's okay. Let's get that coat off, right? She nodded, or maybe it had just been a tremble. I couldn't tell anymore. She was constantly shivering. I slipped a hand between her shoulder and the coat, intending to pull her left arm through and then work on the right. No wonder Susan was complaining of being hot. It felt stifling in there and her skin was slimy. My hand went numb. I froze. A great chill crawled through my body, starting from the very top of my head and all the way down to my toes. The reek of the coat enveloped me. I could taste it in the back of my mouth, a metallic flavor like pennies. I tried to pull my hand out from under the coat. Something resisted. I couldn't feel what was trapping me. My arm was numb up to my elbow. I braced my other hand against the brick wall and yanked with all my strength. My muscles bulged under the strain, but my hand began to pull free. Under the yellow lamppost light, I saw hundreds of threads connecting my hand and wrist to the inside of the coat. I didn't know what I was seeing. I didn't want to know what I was seeing. I fell back, pulling my numb hand to my chest. I landed on my back and raised my hand into the light. I saw the tubes throbbing in time with my heartbeat, filled with my blood. I gripped the thread still connecting me to the coat and felt their hot fleshiness in the palm of my other hand. They were strong, fibrous, hollow. I ripped those probing tongues out of my left hand. I didn't feel any pain. The numbness was complete. I tore and yanked and scratched until all those violating probes were out of me on the pavement. The appendages twitched on the ground, spraying blood. They ended in sharp, hollow points like the tip of a needle. My hands were drenched in blood. There were hundreds of gaping holes in my skin, each the size of a grain of rice. My blood flowed freely. Scrambling about until I was back on my knees, I was brought back to myself in the sight of Susan. The fur coat had engulfed her head, her shoulders, chest, and arms. Her legs, sucked dry and spasming on the sidewalk, were the only things I could see. The fur coat clenched, and I heard a dull, thick crunch from within it. 
Oh, God, Susan! I reached for the coat, but I could only grab at it with one hand. It convulsed, and I heard another crunch as it folded lower toward Susan's pelvic area. Her legs had stopped moving. I fell away from her, pulling myself further into the street. The coat snapped and crushed its way down her hips, her thighs, over her knees, and down her calves. No blood was spilled. The coat wasted nothing. In the distance, I heard the shouts from Commercial Street. I choked on my own bile as I tried to call for help. I retched up onto the front of my costume, hot tears burning my eyes. My bloody hand slipped across my sweating face, covering my eyes, my mouth. The coat lipped delicately over her feet, single shoe and all. It constricted, growing more compact. Its thick white fur glowed in the moonlight, highlighted gold by the sodium streetlights. Not a speck of blood stained it. I heard heels sounding against the sidewalk. A broad shadow enveloped me. I looked towards the sound, reaching out with crimson hands for help. Mrs. Cutler pushed me away. Please! I pointed to the humped coat that lay on the sidewalk, throbbing in rhythmic fashion. It's too late for her. We three were fools, I for lending the coat to a dumb little girl and the two of you for not heeding my rules. I'll take the coat back to my museum now. It's sated after decades of fasting. It will be safe. The Amazon crept up on the coat. Despite her words, she still pulled a pair of elbow-length leather gloves. She glanced both ways down the street. The sounds of merriment were fading as the party on commercial wound down. Soon the streets would be full of people going home. Mrs. Cutler reached down and picked up the coat, holding it away from her body. We have to call the police. You, you can't. You can't just take it. She's in there. In an hour, there'll be nothing left but feces, reminiscent of the ones owls make. Or so I was told by my grandmother. Truth be told, I've never fed it. I thought it dead. Again, we three made mistakes tonight. I reached out for her, for the coat, for my girlfriend. Mrs. Cutler pushed past me. I'll tell them. I'll call the cops. She didn't answer. She didn't have to. What would I tell them? The only blood was on my hands. Mrs. Rumtefusel's Fur Coat P. L. McMillan I watched Susan stomp down the sidewalk past West Salem Junior High School on 8th Street, her patent black shoes crushing the calico carpet of dried leaves as she went. Hurry up, Michael, she called over one shoulder. I shook my head, bouncing my car keys in my hand. What is this place supposed to be called again? I asked. Molly said it was off 8th between the junior high...